Hi everyone, welcome back to another lesson. I hope you are all doing well. In this lesson, we're talking about a condition known as erythema nodosum. And erythema nodosum is a skin condition, and more specifically, it is an acute nodular paniculitis. We'll discuss what each of these words mean here in a moment. But it's more so a result of some other underlying condition. So we'll discuss all of that and some of the stages and how the symptoms of erythema nodosum evolve, and we'll also talk about how it's diagnosed and treated in this lesson. So as I mentioned before, erythema nodosum is a skin condition. It's acute nodular paniculitis more specifically. Acute meaning that it comes on quite suddenly. Nodular meaning that it involves nodules, so it's focalized areas of inflammation. And paniculitis, itis means inflammation, and the panicule prefix means subcutaneous fat. So erythema nodosum is actually an inflammation of fat cells or adipocytes under the skin. So that subcutaneous fat under the skin. Now, the exact pathophysiological mechanism as to why erythema nodosum occurs is not entirely understood, but it is known to be a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So it's going to be T cell mediated. It's going to be likely due to certain antigens, certain immune complexes that get into the subcutaneous fat and ultimately lead to an immune reaction to those antigens leading to inflammation. Now when we look into the epidemiology as to which types of patients are more likely to get erythema nodosum, females are going to outnumber males by three to six to one. So every one male patient that has this, there are three to six female patients that have this condition. And most cases of erythema nodosum are going to occur between the ages of 18 to 34. Some sources say 25 to 40. And even though those are the ages where it's most likely to occur, we can see this occurring in other age groups as well. And the key thing about erythema nodosum is that it can occur in many different medical conditions. We'll discuss those medical conditions here in a moment. And for instance, an example of this is that it is actually the most common skin finding in Crohn's disease. So we're first going to talk about some infectious causes of erythema nodosum, but it, before we talk about those infectious causes, it's important to point out that the majority of cases of erythema nodosum are idiopathic, meaning that we don't actually know the underlying cause or there's no associated underlying cause that's leading to the erythema nodosum. And actually 30 to 50% of cases of erythema nodosum are idiopathic. So let's first talk about the infectious causes of erythema nodosum. So we'll first talk about bacterial causes. So the bacterial causes are going to include streptococcus. So streptococcal infections are actually going to be the most common cause in children. So a streptococcal pharyngitis or strep throat. So that's going to be very important. Tuberculosis is also another potential cause. This was more of a more prominent cause in the past, but due to changes in how tuberculosis has been screened and treated, we don't see as much tuberculosis, especially in developed countries. Mycoplasma pneumonia is also another potential cause. We can also see it with leprosy. Individuals have leprosy. They can also have erythema nodosum. Having certain gastrointestinal infections can also lead to an erythema nodosum condition as well. These include Seminella and Campylobacter jejuni infections. Then we can also see some sexually transmitted infections that can lead to erythema nodosum. These include infections with chlamydia trachomatis and lymphogranuloma venerium, which are caused by other serotypes of chlamydia. Yersinia enterocolitica is also another potential cause of erythema nodosum. This is actually a very common cause in Finland. And then some other infectious causes can include brucellosis, cat scratch disease, so it's infection with Bartonella bacteria, psittacosis. Psittacosis is going to be a bacterial infection that individuals who have parrots as pets can get. And then leptospirosis is going to be a infectious disease caused by often exposure to animal urine. And we can often see this with surfers. So those are some bacterial infectious causes. We can also see it from protozole infections as well, including with amoeba or entamoeba histolytica, and also in giardiasis, so giardia lamblia infections. Other infectious causes can include fungal infections, so coccidioidal mycosis, or San Joaquin Valley fever. This is actually going to be the most common cause of erythema nodosum in the American Southwest, and this occurs three days to three weeks after the fever. And then some other fungal infections that can lead to erythema nodosum include histoplasmosis and blastomycosis. And then some viral infections that can lead to erythema nodosum include infectious mononucleosis. We can see it with EBV viral infections. So that would be infectious mononucleosis, hep B and C infections. HIV patients can also have 
erythematosum, and then we can also see it with human T lymphotrophic virus or HTLV1 infections. Some other causes include medications. So some typical medications that have been associated with this condition include sulfonamide antibiotics. So patients are taking Septra, for instance, for a UTI. That's trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. This can lead to erythematidosum in some of those patients. Certain penicillin antibiotics can lead to this condition. Sulfonyl ureas can also do that as well. These are anti-diabetic medications. There is a possible association with oral contraceptive use. So that's something that can potentially be a cause of erythematidosum or EN. And gold exposure can also lead to this condition as well. Certain enteropathies or gastrointestinal conditions can lead to erythematidosum. These include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We talked about Crohn's disease having erythematidosum as the most common skin finding in that particular condition. Ulcerative colitis, 10% of patients with ulcerative colitis will have erythematidosum and it's often going to occur five years after the onset of the condition. Certain cancers can also lead to this as well, and some of them include certain types of leukemia and also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then we can also see with other conditions, some autoimmune conditions like Bessette's disease. In pregnancy, this can also occur. It's often going to be in the second trimester of pregnancy. And sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is actually going to be one of the most common causes in adult patients. And in fact, 10 to 22% of patients who have erythematidosum will also have sarcoidosis. And additionally, with regards to sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis can be part of a another condition known as Lofgren's syndrome. And Lofgren's syndrome has not only erythematidosum, but it also has bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, which is a finding in sarcoidosis. It also has acute arthritis and also has uveitis as well. So now let's discuss the evolution of symptoms of erythematidosum. So there is generally considered a prodromal stage or prodromal phase. So there's going to be symptoms that start before these skin lesions occur. So this prodromal phase is often going to take place over three to six days. So there's usually you have these certain types of symptoms for three to six days, and then you have this onset of these skin lesions that we're just going to discuss here soon. And the symptoms of the prodromal phase, even though they start before the skin lesions can occur, they can continue throughout the entire condition. Nevertheless, three to six days before you have those skin lesions, we can have symptoms like fever, generalized achy joints, and possibly abdominal pain. Then this is going to lead into what is called the eruptive phase. So in the first week of the eruptive phase, nodules are going to spontaneously occur. They often become tense, hard, and painful, and they are generally a bright red in coloration. And then over the course of the next week, in the second week, the nodules may fluctuate in size, make it a bit larger, they make it a bit smaller, and then they will often change color to a darker color, perhaps a darker reddish color, or can even change into a bluish or grayish color. Generally, these skin lesions are going to last for two weeks, but they can last even longer. And we may see in some cases that some skin lesions may occur, they can last for two weeks, but then even over the course of three to six weeks, new skin lesions can continue to erupt and that can generally extend how long a patient can have these skin lesions. Eventually though, there's going to be a resolution of the symptoms. The skin lesions will resolve and we go into what we call the regressive phase. And the regressive phase we'll discuss in more detail when we talk about some of the treatments later. So once we're in that eruptive phase, there's a sudden onset of these skin lesions or these nodules. And these are considered erythematous eruptions, so they're reddish in coloration when they first occur. These nodules are going to be firm and hard, so if you were to feel them, they can feel a bit firm, and they can also feel warm to touch. And then in some cases, we can have plaques. Plaques are going to be raised skin lesions greater than 10 millimeters in diameter, so they're not going to be as raised as nodules. Nodules will feel like a larger bump, but plaques can be a just a slightly raised skin lesion. So these nodules and plaques are going to be painful and tender to touch. Their borders are not well defined, so we can kind of see an, a border here, but it's not very well defined like we might see with condition like cellulitis, for instance. These skin lesions kind of have to be red, they can be elevated as well. And important to point out is that there's no ulceration of the skin lesions in erythema nodosum. And these nodules and lesions can actually be more painful when patients are standing upright. So that's also important to point out here as well. 
And what we often find is that at any one time, we are going to see roughly three to six nodules. There are going to be anywhere from one to six centimeters in diameter. They occur bilaterally and they are oftentimes symmetric. So if you're seeing some on one side, you're going to see some on the other side in the same location at least. And most of the time, they're going to occur over the anterior tibia, so on the shins, so on the lower front of the legs. But we can also see them on the thighs, we can see them on the ankles, and we can even see them on the arms in some cases as well. But most of the time, they're going to be on the shins. Now, some other potential symptoms that we can see have to do with that prodromal phase that we talked about before, so having that generalized achy joint pain, so arthralgia. So this arthralgia can continue throughout the condition. Actually, more than half of patients will complain of arthralgia. Again, we mentioned that they occur before the eruption of nodules, and they can also occur during the eruption of the nodules as well. And in some cases, we mentioned the prodromal phase being three to six days most of the time. The arthralgia itself can actually occur even earlier than that. It can actually occur two to four weeks prior to nodular eruption. The joints themselves are going to be red, swollen, and tender. There are going to be morning stiffness. So when you wake up, your joints feel a bit stiff. They feel a bit hard to get going. And then the ankles, knees, and wrists are going to be the most common joints affected. We can also see aching legs, which may last for many weeks. And we can also see ankle edema. This is going to be a relatively common finding with regards to having erythema nodosum. If you have erythema nodosum, a lot of these patients can have ankle edema as well. And then depending on the underlying cause, if there is any, if it's idiopathic, we may not have any other symptoms or findings. But if there is an underlying cause, as mentioned before, sarcoidosis is going to be one of the most common causes in adults, 10 to 22% of patients that have erythema nodosum are going to have sarcoidosis. And in sarcoidosis, we have bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. So you'd have a chest x-ray that looks like this. And if there is an infection that can have certain other findings like bloody diarrhea, we can see that with Campylobacter jejuni infections. We may see water diarrhea and potentially bloody diarrhea in salmonella infections. We can see in brucellosis undulating fevers. We can see in tuberculosis, there may be a decreased weight, night sweats, hemoptysis. With a fungal infection, there may be other findings that we may see. And if it is Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, for instance, we may see some either water diarrhea in Crohn's disease or bloody diarrhea in ulcerative colitis. So if we see some other symptoms that can help us determine some of the potential causes of the erythema nodosum. Now let's discuss the diagnosis and treatment of erythema nodosum. So the diagnosis is often going to be clinical diagnosis. We're going to get a general history to see the progression of symptoms. We see that patients can have those prodromal symptoms like achy joint pain that can last throughout. And we can actually see some of the skin lesions on generally on their shins. That can be enough to make the diagnosis. But we often want to do other tests because, again, even though 30 to 50% of cases are idiopathic, there are important potential causes of erythema nodosum, including strep throat. So we might want to do a throat culture, look at anti-streptolysin titers. If it is a potential infection, we can do stool cultures. If there's any question of tuberculosis or sarcoidosis, we can do chest radiographs, look for bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy in sarcoidosis, or we can look for unilateral hilar lymphadenopathy in tuberculosis. So looking at that list of potential causes, we can generally look for other symptoms and then go accordingly into doing certain other tests to determine what that potential underlying cause might be. How do clinicians treat erythema nodosum? The treatment is going to be dependent on the underlying cause. Once we've sort of ruled out a lot of the main causes, if we can't find any other cause, then that's an idiopathic case. But if we do find some other cause, we can treat it with antibiotics. If it's going to be an infectious cause, for instance, if it's Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, there's certain treatments for those conditions. Or if it's a certain medication, we'd stop the medication and, and use an alternative. So treatments like that are going to be involved. With regards to more specific information on infection-induced erythema nodosum, there's generally going to be a spontaneous resolution of symptoms within seven weeks, although we may see lesions lasting up to 18 weeks in some cases. And with regards to idiopathic erythema nodosum, 30% of cases last longer than six months. So the idiopathic cases are going to be longer lasting. One way that generally helps, regardless of the cause of the condition, is reducing activity. So reducing activity, not standing on your legs, as I mentioned before, standing can worsen the pain from these nodules that we 
get in this condition. So generally not being physically active, just staying resting can often help. This actually may reduce the length of disease. It also helps with symptoms as well. Utilizing analgesics, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can be used. Colchicine has also been used as well as a potential treatment. So some medications to help with pain. And overall though, again, depending on the cause and depending on how it's treated, the joint pain and swelling can last a bit longer than even some of the lesions. The joint pain and swelling may last up to six months. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.